I think we can begin, yeah. Thank you, first of all, and uh, for the enlightening lecture, and I hope you remember when I meet you at the University of Lagos, 60, uh, 69. Yes. I'm glad to see you again, my brother. And, uh, and I hope the struggle for the African people will continue, and I think it will continue, and the African people are very, very conscious. Wherever they go, they are becoming conscious of the problem, either in the United States or somewhere else. And uh, even the American people themselves, they are, coming, they are becoming aware of the struggle that the African, they are leading and they are trying to help themselves. Because when I came here and many of the African people, the same situation, African or, or ignored as a kind of, uh, of curiosity to come to them. But I think most of them are becoming aware of the African people that they exist as a human being like them. And, they sh and many of them, they share the struggle. Already they're starting sharing the struggle. Uh, I just want you to ask some questions. Do you think, uh, one question in fact, do you, do you think socialism, Russian I mean here, or communism is fit for the African people? Or the African people should create their own socialism or their own communism, something which is very congenial to their own culture, to their own ideology, instead of importing another ideology, Russian. Because I do, personally, I do not believe that the Russian socialism or the Chinese communism is or fit for the African people. The African people have to produce because the, social, uh, the social, uh, Russian socialism, it was for the Russian people, not for the African people, like the NATO, or even to some extent, the United Nation. And they, here I go beyond. The United Nation or the NATO was n or not for the African people, because they were not created, not motivated by the African people. So I think you have to think about the idea of importing Russian or communism or any foreign ideology to Africa. We have to create from our intelligentsia, from our, our knowledge to your, as you refer to it. We have to create our consciousness. Thank you so much again. Thank you for the question. It was good to see you again. 1969, Lagos. Lagos University, Lagos in the basement in the library. I remember it, I remember it, thank you. Well, the struggle continues, the struggle continues. We get stronger, as a matter of fact, more determined to win. Truth, we know, is universal. It must be. Two plus two is four in China. Two plus two is four in Moscow. Two plus two is four in Timbuktu. Two plus two is four in Athens, Georgia. Truth is universal. Truth cannot be invented. It can only be observed and reported. Scientific socialism is a truth. Of course, in our compilation of knowledge, in our attempts to help assist ourselves remember things, sometimes for the sake of remembrance, we may become a little bit sloppy about precision. Let me give you an example of what I speak. We may call the laws of gravity Newton laws. That is to say, we refer to them commonly as Newton's laws. Newton cannot invent that a body in motion tends to stay in motion unless stopped by an outside force. He cannot invent this. The best that Newton can do is to observe it, and the best we can do is to know that he might have been the first man to have recorded it, written or oral. But certainly, as a baby, I knew that a body in motion tends to stay in motion unless stopped by an outside force when I ran into an object. I say we call it Newton's law, but Newton couldn't invent it. He observed it. So too, we come to confuse socialism sometimes in the capitalist system, wherever we make mistakes will aid us in our mistakes. Aid us in our mistakes. Aid us to make them bigger, that is. Yeah. We come to see socialism sometimes as belonging to Marx, or belonging to Engels, or belonging to the Russians, or belonging to the Chinese, not at all. Just as the laws of gravity cannot belong to Newton, so too the laws of socialism cannot belong to Marx. They cannot belong to Engels. The best that they can do is to properly observe these laws and record them. The best we can do is say, these are people who were the first we know to have recorded socialism or concepts and precepts of socialism. Socialism is a universal truth. Its principles are, one, that the people must own and control the means of production. Number two, the system must be planned properly, and there must be all scientific and technique data used to improve it. 
power must come from the people and be emanated by the people. I'm coming, I'm coming. That is to say that socialism in Russia, socialism in China, socialism in Europe, socialism in Africa must be the same like two plus two. It may look different. Its manifestations will be different. There are different cultures. The culture of China is not the culture of Africa. Because they're different cultures doesn't mean that they're automatically antagonistic to each other. Not at all. The culture of Europe, the culture of Africa, are different cultures. Therefore, the manifestation of socialism in Africa, the manifestation of socialism in China, the manifestation of socialism in Russia will be different but the essence will be the same as it is with two plus two. If we went to China and we wanted to see two plus two is four, they will do two plus two is four for us on the Abascus board. If we go to Africa and we ask for two plus two is four, they will do two plus two is four for us with the Kori beads. If we go to Russia and we ask for two plus two, they may give us two plus two is four with wheat grain. They're different manifestations, but the essence is the same. The truth is there. Therefore, we in Africa must fight for scientific socialism. Those in Russia must fight for scientific socialism. And just since no one has a monopoly on socialism, it is not to be assumed that any one country will be the first to arrive at socialism. That one must be clear. And also, since no one has a monopoly on socialism, it cannot be assumed that if one country moves forward and makes mistakes and falls back and even seems to be revising its stand, that's no reason for us to be discouraged. On the contrary, we hold stronger to truth. Remember when the colonization, the French or the English came? Yes. The same thing, the, like just recently in Ethiopia. I think they say socialism, but the books of Lenin and Marxists are sold there. We don't need them. No, let, no we can read them. We I can mean, always they, learn. They came, remember the French, what, did, when they, what we call assimilation, the policy of assimilation. When the French came, they colonized, the produ they wanted to produce African French, and they did, like Songor. Exactly. You, you see, you see. And you, in France, they, they have uh, so a white, white French representing the French ambassador, uh, Senegalese ambassador. But these people, when they came, if, be, if we bring Russia, they don't come just as they don't, socialism is associated with them. So as they come there, you uh, have okay. their flag, you have their books, I understand yeah, the problem. and their language. I understand that the problem. Is what okay. I, I think, uh, the problem here is not so much socialism as the objective as much as our cultural integrity and the ideology. Socialism is an objective, the ideology. That is, that thing which is to guide us to socialism must be ours and authentically ours. Our party fights for socialism. For example, the Chinese Communist Party, holding true to its principles, fights for socialism. The Chinese use Maoism as an ideology to get them to socialism in China. If I in Africa also use Maoism to get me, I'll be confused. I can only use the culture of Africa to arrive me at where I want to go. Therefore, my ideology is encrumism, and here I'm correct. But this encrumism is not at all in opposition to Marxism-Leninism, not at all, on the contrary. We take the universal truths of Marx and Lenin. We take the universal truths of Mao Zedong. We take the universal truths of Ho Chi Minh. We take the universal truths of the capitalist system because truth can come out of the mouth of anyone, even the enemy. And these truths we take and we mold, but these truths are molded according to our culture, our understanding, and the level of production of our society. It's not imposed, and we cannot at all impose ideology, never. Thank you. My name is Doug Teeper. I'm organizer of the Truth Demands Justice Concern. I'm glad. And victim of the Kent State atrocities. Oh, excellent. And I'm also a candidate for student body government. I'd like, for you, I'd like your opinion is, um, can destruction of the system best come within or outside force? Uh, what do you mean outside? Do you mean, because I'm not sure. Some people say, I want to get inside the system, then I help overturn it. But when they get inside, they look like all the others. And it do like all the others. So do you mean to get in the system, or do you mean an over... I'm not sure, are you talking outside or inside, physically or ideologically? Well, it must be ideologically, obviously. No, it can be physically, and there you can cause destruction within the system. Yes. Don't you believe that capitalism is a self-destructive uh, system? It is. It is. That's right. But, uh, so can you not, if you um, obtain a position inside capitalism, can you not thus hurry the process? 
Yes, but you must hurry the process. What I say is that some people, if they're not careful, get into the process and automatically become contaminated with the process. As a matter of fact, the only safeguard against going into the system and messing with the system is when you have an ideology which is diametrically opposed to capitalism. That is to say, once you know, once you go in there and you know properly the truth and you have an organization which continually aids you in your ideological struggle, because if you go in by, there, by yourself, with all the honesty and integrity, you will come out probably corrupt. The best you can do is just to walk out without being corrupted. Well, I congratulate you for your work as an organizer. I salute you for your work on the Kent State. You should keep up the struggle. It is a just struggle. Do not be discouraged. I wish you good luck in your campaign. And if you get elected, use your office for the students. Use your office for the students uncompromisingly. Use it. The revolution comes. Yes, uh, I would like to ask you, do you believe in the Martin Luther, Martin Luther, King, uh, Martin Luther King theory, or are you strictly communist? Also, like I was born and raised on a farm, and like uh, I can't use all these philosophical words, so forth and so on, and I'm not, well, I went a year and a half of junior college, but I didn't get a degree. But uh, uh, I would really like to know do you believe a person like uh, John Roseberg told me, the uh, professional baseball player said once, you can go to elementary school and like you learn a little knowledge. And when you come out of high school, you're supposed to learn common sense. But when you go to college, that's where your degrees come in. That's where your education come in. He said you can miss one of the three and you can come out of school an educated fool. Do you, please, do you believe people are supposed to have common sense or the education? Let's see. I think I can detect three questions. That's On the true. first question, as a brother born on a farm, if I use words which you don't understand, please, let me tell you that what you should do is to write those words down and go study them and know them as well as I know them. Because there's nothing I can do that you can't do. And you must never let anybody whoop you with any knowledge because it belongs to everybody. And as your brother, I urge you and encourage you to learn these words and to understand them, to know capitalism, to know communism, and to know socialism. I urge you to know them for yourself, not to take my word for it, or anybody else's word for it, because they're forces that are fighting in the world over it. On your question about Dr. King, no conscious man, no conscious woman can have any principal disagreement with Dr. King. I, being a conscious man, striving every day to be more conscious than I was yesterday, can never have any principled disagreement with Dr. King. Dr. King was a man who demonstrated properly that above all, the interests of the masses came first. He clearly demonstrated that the value of his life could never be questioned in terms of a relationship in regards to the people's interest. Myself, for me, this is the greatest good. This is the best life that a man can live. I, however, do disagree with Dr. King on certain tactical areas. <clears throat> now, the confusion arises, again, once you make a mistake, you see the press will help to create and widen the diversions. The problem arises because Dr. King, while being a great man, while being a sincere man, while being a devout man, was a man who made some mistakes. The mistakes he made represent us because he fought for us. He came from us. He fought with us. Therefore, we have a responsibility to properly analyze the mistakes that Dr. King made so that we ourselves do not repeat these mistakes. The television press, the mass media, those who control the society today do not want this. As a matter of fact, they want to further confuse us. Let me show you how the confusion can arise. They can say, for example, Dr. Martin Luther King, and right out of Dr. Martin Luther King, next word coming out of their mouth is nonviolence. So that when you talk about Dr. King, as a matter of fact, all you talk about is nonviolence. 
The very question which you raise is that when you say the Dr. Martin Luther King theory, I know what you mean to say, nonviolence. Dr. King's error was that he confused a tactic with a principle. Nonviolence is not a principle. It cannot be. It can only be a tactic. It is a means to achieve certain ends. Dr. King, because he was an honest man, because he was a sincere man, because he was a dedicated man, and because he had a history of theology, it was easy for him to confuse this tactic, nonviolence, and make it a principle. Once Dr. King made the confusion of making a tactic a principle, that is to make nonviolence, which is a tactic a principle, Dr. King now had to say, because he was an honest man, that the only way we can achieve our liberation is through nonviolence. What he now did was to say the only way. If you examine properly this statement, it means that if Dr. King could achieve his liberation by getting an army together and a battalion together and waging some struggle with the army, he won't do it. That the only way he will do it is through nonviolence. Obviously, this is an error. Nonviolence is not a principle, it is a tactic. As a member of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, I didn't join the Southern Christian Leadership Conference because the Southern Christian Leadership Conference advocated that nonviolence must be a way of life. A principle. I joined the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, which advocated that nonviolence was a tactic. That is to say, for us in SNCC, if we could achieve our liberation, if we could achieve our objective by being nonviolent, we'd be nonviolent. But if in order to achieve the liberation of our people, we have to throw some hand grenades, we're chucking them. I hope you understood it. <laughs> Uh, I've been following closely what has been going on in the press as regards the American Red, Red China relationship. And uh, I know that uh, a lot of third world countries have been trying to em emulate Chinese approach of socialism. And I'm not sure whether where this relationship between Red China and the US is going to, how this is going to change things you know, as far as the third world or uh, developing countries are concerned. What do you think about this relationship? Is it going to uh, help Chinese people in their drive towards socialism? The policies being directed by the leadership of China can in no way help the masses of the people of China. When the Chinese vice premier stands and tells us that America, China, and the third, so-called third world countries should join hands against the Soviet Union, he is a totally confused man. My biggest enemy is not the Soviet Union. My biggest enemy right now is Smith and Vorster and American imperialism. And I will not have him come and confuse me, just like the Americans can't tell me who my enemy is, he cannot tell me who my enemy is. He will not confuse me. My enemy is American imperialism. If he needs to join hands with America for Russia, that's his problem. That's his problem. But certainly he cannot sell out the interests of the millions of the Chinese people who struggle and suffer and move forward for socialism. It cannot be destroyed. The movement can only go forward. There are setbacks always. No reason to be discouraged with scientific development. We will go forward. He's only trying to confuse. My enemy is not the Soviet Union. Why I'm going to Soviet Union with Smith stand? Does it mean that I should join hands with Smith and we go fight the Soviet Union? He sounds just like Smith. He sounds just like Foster. That's just what they say. He's a communist, the Soviet Union. Let's give them the guns to shoot us. He sounds just like him. No wonder he's in Zaire holding up puppet regimes in Africa. But uh, we do not, of course, denounce the Chinese people. We know the people will move forward to freedom. But the reactionary leadership, it will die away as surely as Mao Zedong died. Mm -hmm. Well, we thank you. The One more question. I'm sorry. I'd, I'd <clears throat> just like to state an opinion. Um, you said that... Uh, capitalism is backwards and 
It should be stupid, destroyed. Stupid, 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 stupid repul reactionary, repulsive. and barbaric. No, I didn't use the yeah. word repulsive. That's too mild. Okay. Well, I'd just like to state my opinion that uh, I think violence is barbaric and stupid and repulsive, and that's my opinion. But please, 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 may I ask you a question? Please. Just for clarification. All right, now, I'm not sure you're agreeing that capitalism is bad or you don't think it's bad. I didn't say. Huh? I didn't say anything about it. Well, what do you think about it? Capitalism? Yes. <laughs> well. <clears throat> well, let me ask you this I, question. Let me ask I, you this I question. I live in a capitalist society. Okay, let me make it easier. Let me make it easier. Okay, yeah, please. Yeah. If you were a slave <laughs> and I were your master, I'd and the you. only way for you to be free was to strike your blow to kill me, what would you do? You didn't answer? <laughs> oh. I didn't hear him answer. <laughs> yes, we're ready. Come on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, get us into the mic. As a Muslim in the United States, I've been uh, encouraged by the power of religion in Iran in eradicating oppression. And I'd like, I wonder if you would speak to, I'm a little nervous, <laughs> I wonder if you would speak to that power, the power of the faith uh, and the unity of people in one God and to see, you know, to see what role you think that plays in world affairs? I can address myself, particularly the question about Islam, but I would like to address it generally to all religions. That is to say, not just Islam. I will speak also of Christianity, Hare Krishna movement, unification of God, all religions. The reason why men and women cling to religions is because all religions preach righteousness. All religions tell us that in the end, irrespective of the struggles that we must undergo, irrespective of all the struggles and the injustices that we have to bear, that we should bear these with the conviction and the knowledge that in the end, justice will triumph. This is the essence of all great religions. Of course, we know that principles live on. Unfortunately, it's the weakness and the failings of humanity that cannot make us properly grab the principles. A Christian cannot be a Christian if there is injustice and that Christian is not actively fighting against injustice. A Muslim cannot be a true upholder of Islam, cannot claim to be a follower of the prophet of Muhammad if in the face of injustice all he does is bow down five times a day. A member of Hare Krishna movement cannot really claim to be a member of Hare Krishna movement if in the face of injustice all they do is chant. No. We say all true religions tell us that it is our responsibility to struggle against injustice. Religions, like all things, are tools and weapons. They can either be used for the benefit of humanity, like knowledge, or they can be used against humanity. I say, depending upon who is controlling the religion, it will either be used for the benefit of humanity or against humanity. Reverend Ike <laughs> claims to be a minister of the gospel. Dr. Martin Luther King claims to be a minister of the gospel. Ike preaches Christianity. King preaches Christianity. Ike uses Christianity to rip off the people. King uses Christianity to mobilize the people, put the people in the street, and make the people fight against injustice while singing hymns and chanting the name of the Lord. All truly religious people, 
must be involved in struggles against injustice. All truly religious people must be revolutionary. If one says one is a Christian, if one says that one has the love of Allah in one's heart, if one says that one follows the principles of origins and one is not fighting against injustice, one is a hypocrite and the truth is not in one and one is not a child of God, one is in fact a servant of the devil. We can get him go. Last question. Yeah, I've, I've been active in uh, the prisons in the United States since the Rockefeller slaughter in Attica in 1971. I applaud you because I applaud all organizers and strugglers for justice. And you spoke earlier of, uh, of lack of organization. And uh, I've, been to, I've been to Attica and I've returned to Auburn prison, the so-called black man's university since 1971. I've gone back every year. And uh, I wonder what your, how, what your feelings are or if you have any theories as far as how there could be more of a outside inside communication for not between blacks and be between prisoners in general. I mean, how can we make more awareness and more, more uh, communicate uh, in this? Because I really think there's a great need for it. Through the only way, the only way is through organization. The best way is through revolutionary organizations. But the only way is organization. It is only through organization that, first of all, the education will be systematic on a constant basis, which is necessary. We, as revolutionaries, know that it doesn't make sense to begin a job and put the job down without finishing the job. Not only will the job discourage us, but it will discourage others who come after us. Therefore, revolutionary organizations of parties which incorporate the prisoners inside the parties and do not make the prisoners a separate entity outside from the people. This is the only way. We wish to thank you and again, if you disagree with me, I've got no problem. That's no problem. I do want you, however, to use your knowledge for humanity and don't let the capitalist system use you. Thank you. Those African students who are conscious, if you please just uh, come on the right side of the room if you want to do some serious work for the people or hear about it. On the right side of the room.